So we got this. <laughs> we got this thing. So Justin Marks is, yes, the writer of Street Fighter, The Legend of Chun-Li. Shadow of the Colossus, the film, has been in development hell for years and years and years now, going on a decade. Um, and so th there is at least another draft after this. Um, that I have not been able to get a hold of. If if it ever does come to actually exist, uh, this script is is almost certainly not going to be representative of what. Uh, or sorry, I shouldn't say is not going to be representative. That is a that that is too big of a claim to make. This script is not going to be the script that they will be using. So when I first started talking about this on Twitter, a whole bunch of people were responding with things like, oh, well, if there's any dialogue at all, they've already failed, and similar kind of things, like saying this, like, oh, well, you can't adapt it because the game doesn't have dialogue, the game doesn't have talking, so you can't adapt it. And that's not true. So. The fact that there is talking and dialogue and stuff like that, I don't consider that in any way to be to undermine the themes of the game. And I don't consider it either to be necessarily as big of a hurdle as it seems at first glance. The real problem that I have, and now even even one of the things, one of the main things that I railed about on uh, Twitter, was the flashbacks. And now something that I didn't stress there that I kind of wish I had is that the flashbacks in and of themselves, their existence isn't the problem. I have no problem with a Shadow of the Colossus film using flashbacks and maybe removing some of the um, circumstantial ambiguity. Uh, I just... I purely have a problem with the content of those flashbacks. The, the first few pages are basically lifted straight from, uh, straight from the game. Um, it's essentially the opening cinematic. Uh, goes, Dorm, uh, uh, Dorman shows up. You know, they have, they have a short conversation basically similar to the one they have in the game and then it all starts page four is when it starts going off the rails and he always uses this one moon earlier this is he can't gotta gotta make it sound exotic so there's a lot of verbal markers in here that are basically just saying poverty um and you know alien foreign and scary savage you know, man slices open a turtle's underside. Feeds like also he doesn't he doesn't know how turtles he like turtles turtles have a shell. A mix of here we go. Fantastic sentence here, just amazing. A potent mix of tribal Hindu, Aztec, Shinto Japanese. Okay, so, um, none of those are tribal, two of those are religions, and one of those is one of the most advanced civilizations to ever live in the Americas. So, wait, is there a line that is religion everywhere? Yes, yes, that is the... That that is the line. Religion everywhere. So yeah. Also, the description of uh, carved into a mountain plateau. So we're being given this image of like, oh well, it's kind of it's it's in the mountains. That's gonna come up later when it comes to the description of the terrain. Pay attention to it because there's two things that are spatially related in a way that was not thought about. Now, the farmer farmer comes out and basically beats the horse for no reason. So, Agro, we learned that Agro is called Agro because because he's really mean.
Um, it's the horse who's in charge right now, cutting past cliffs and stone barriers at breakneck speed, hooves trampling the tall grass, unfearing and incredible. Wander doesn't try to take over. He knows what it's like to crave the exhilaration of escape, so he lets the horse have his moment. And only because he doesn't force it does the horse begin to respect this young rider, allowing him to take the reins. When he does, Agro acknowledges him by speeding up. He cedes control, not to a master, but to an equal. So this is thematically what um, Justin Marks is setting up. This this is Justin Marks apparently played Shadow of the Colossus and then started to write a script. And for whatever reason, the theme that popped out to him was about imprisonment. He he wrote the script to be about imprisonment so the whole thing about wander and agro like that they they respect each other not because not because wander just kind of you know has a big horse like he couldn't just he couldn't just have a horse there needs to be backstory between him and the horse he can't you can't just you, you can't just start off a script with a dude having a horse and liking his horse he gets thrown into the river and sees mono washing her face in the river about five foot five, not an inch to spare, slender frame, brown eyes, and familiar because she's the girl we saw in the beginning. Her name is Mono right now. She's rinsing a bruise on her upper cheek, the kind you could only get in one way. I was just like, oh no. Oh no. He just gets knocked out by a bunch of soldiers, gets dragged to Lord Emon, uh, Darth, Darth Emon, bad guy, villainous the third um this this scene is kind of hilarious in just how stupid it is this is lord Emon 50s think of him as the spiritual leader to these people now this here look think about just how like garbage a line that is think of him as the spiritual leader to these people Is he? Like, because that, that puts doubts in there. You're suggesting it like he's just, like that's just an analog. Is, but he is, isn't he? He's the chief shaman. He, you described him as a shaman. He is, he's not like a spiritual leader. He is. He's the spirit. He is the spiritual leader. He doesn't look up when the chief warrior enters, so you know that he's like no BS. Busy dusting off a small figurine of an idol. Um, caught a thief with the farmer's horse. Does he belong to us? No, he's an outsider. Eamon grabs a half-eaten apple and rises. Unfortunate. Just vague menace because it's a small figurine of an idol so it's not yeah it's 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 not an idol in and of itself it's just a graven image of an idol <laughs> it is it is a uh, it is a graphical representation it is, it is a graphical representation of an idol, but not but not an idol of in it in 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 and of itself. It's not just it's not just a tiny idol. It's it's a replica of an idol. Yeah, yeah. One of the changes that they made here is that the colossi are uh, the idol gods of. Iman's faith. Yeah, so they they leave him in this bamboo cage and he had to go with with Chop Suey. The font. The font that he chose. Planted among them is a sign, a warning to travelers, the same phrase in many languages, including ours. And then in Chop Suey, in, in the font Chop Suey, 
Justin Marks writes, turn back. The warriors throw, wander in, and secure the door with weighted cords. So they just tie the door shut with weighted cords. But there's a lock for him to fiddle with. So Mono shows up, you know, and is just like, hey, oh, her speaking pattern, she is, she is totally a sexy savage. She speaks his language, but really broken. This really bugs me. This really, really bugs me because this is part of the whole, like, why make Wander an outsider thing? And part of it is they have made Wander an outsider, not just in that he's not from this village, but that he speaks another language. Despite the fact that he's only like three days away, the sole point of it is to create this Pocahontas, John Smith relationship between Wander and Mono, where she can she can take on this affectation that that makes her sound ignorant, stupid, and less threatening. Mono, meanwhile, fixes her hands on two dangling cords, levering her foot against the cage, starting to move gears around, and suddenly crack the bottom of the cage drops open and Wander tumbles to the ground. I have no idea what this cage looks like. And the bottom comes out, but they threw him in a door. So it has both a door that has a lock and a bottom that falls out on gears. I don't know. You rode this horse, yes? That's why you brought me here? My father calls him Agro, means demon spirit. No one has ever ridden him before. And so she basically tells him to show me how to ride a horse. He's been tied up like this all his life, hasn't he? It's wrong. You can't keep someone like that. He wants to be free. Justin Marks doesn't understand how horses work or farms or like why a farmer, why would, why a pig farmer would have a horse and what a pig farmer would do with a horse. Basically, uh, her mom died in childbirth, and so she is considered cursed uh, by her people. And here we go. Wander considers this for a long beat, stares at Agro as if the two of them were making up their minds together. Then he turns to the cage and climbs back inside. The bottom dropped out of the cage, but now he's closing the door again. Yeah. So then we go back to back to the shrine of worship. Uh, more conversation with Dorman. Um, I guess Wander, like this, was all kind of Wander narrating to Dorman. There, how he how he got to the shrine. Like he's telling Dorman this story. Like, oh, here's why I'm here. Um, and I do kind of like Dorman's response. Is like she was cursed. It's their way. Hey man, don't don't just dick around with other people's religions. Like, come on, don't be an ass. And then Wander basically goes. There's a travel montage, and he finds, uh, yeah, there we go. He finds Valis. This actually kind of works. Uh, works all right. So the, the the Colossus scenes, or like the the one that I've actually read so far, actually works all right. So um, they changed it a bit from the game, and that's fine. They made it a little bit more cinematic. So Valis is actually like buried underground or whatever, and then like rises up. Though they did change the scale. So like they say that Valis is like a hundred feet tall, which is actually like really, 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 really tall. Um, because they have no self-restraint and they couldn't just be like, it's like Valis is like 30 feet tall and towers over Wander, but is still kind of a comprehensible scale. Wander convulses, drops to his knees, and then they it goes into flashback uh, right as he passes out. And the flashback is basically more of them um, riding the horse, 
And at the end of every night, basically, he climbs back into the cage and Mono goes back home. And then there's a specific line that I'm looking for here, um, which is open landscape. Oh, yeah, here's a then there's the whole scene with the water buffalo where Wander basically mocks her uh, her religion. Exterior farmer's paddock, evening, Mono feeds pigs in inglorious tasks. She's done it all her life, but until now she has never considered just what a miserable job it is. So she finds her mind wandering, stares towards the distant crossroads at the silhouette of a, the young man in the cage. So the crossroads are visible from the pig paddock in the mountain town. And the thing is, is that these become problems in production when you start going through and you start going like through the script and then you're, you know, you're already in production when all of a sudden you're looking at the script and you're like, wait a second, this is supposed to be visible? What? What? Yeah. Um, <coughs> she agrees. She's like, tomorrow I'll go with you. I don't know. Well, we know why they don't just leave then because we as viewers know that Mono is going to die because she's dead in the present of the film. So when she says, tomorrow I will go with you, it might as well put a death clock over her head. You know, Final Fantasy style, just like ticking down. Cause it's like, oh, oh, you're stalling so she can die because you haven't figured out a way to do it organically. You too, sleep all day, no chores. Even though he's speaking his native tongue right now, like this is the amazing part. This is the absolutely fascinating part about the whole language screwery that Marx has written is he goes out of his way to be like, okay, stuff in italics is being spoken in a different language and we're just reading it in subtitles. And yet the subtitles still read like someone speaking a language they don't speak very well. Like it's still super short fragments because Marx is a racist. Something in her is rising, the abuse, the indignation. Standing, uh, standing for it all these years, she wraps her fingers around a spade and cuts her father's hand. He recoils, stares at the fresh blood, shock, pain, then intoxicated rage. I don't think I'm actually reasonably certain that Justin Marx does not know what a spade is. So anyway, yeah, that's how she dies. She dies not in anything actually kind of thematically relevant, she just gets thrown into a barn wall by her abusive dad and dies. This is actually where I stopped. Like, so page 34 here, I was like, no, I can't go on. Because the notes, the, the things that were starting to enrage me were piling up so fast by this point that I was like, no, I need to, I, I need to experience this in a setting where, where I can actually, like, appreciate it. Aftermath, several horses are hitched near the barn. Native women tent. <laughs> like the phrasing. You could just. You could just say women from the village. Or just women. Torches making their way around the shrines of the local cemetery. The El Okay, so. They already mentioned Cairns earlier. Um, Cairns are a... I mean, they're not exclusively. Like, they're a pile of rocks. But normal, normal, normally, normally, if you're going to mention a cairn, the first thought that's going to be, come to people's mind is, oh, funerary rites. It's funerary cairn. Like, that's the, that's the main association of that word is a funerary current Karen which given that this is in the mountains you're in a mountain plateau area it's like oh okay that's how they you know that's their funerary right is that they they put bodies down in a very shallow grave and then put a whole bunch of stones over it because the, you can't dig 
deep into the ground. You don't bury people, per se. You, yeah. And if there's cairns all over the town, it would imply a different religious custom than a cemetery. Also, doubly so, because Mono in this script is considered to be cursed. And yes, the traditional funerary rites of Tibet is feeding bodies to the birds. Okay, so he's going to the sanctuary. Um, yeah, he steals the sword. Um, gets visions of the Forbidden Land. This is, see, this actually makes the script noticeably worse in a lot of ways. So one of the big reasons that the script has now gotten just immeasurably worse by having Wander as an outsider is that the Forbidden Lands don't mean anything to him. You know, the legend of Dorman is meaningless to him. He's never heard of it before. He he just kind of sort of barely learned about it like three days ago. Wanderer arrives in front of Monoseal tomb, leaps off his horse, he stares through the eye slot, her, bo her shrouded body lies within. His hands pry the stones, he hits desperately at the tomb, it rocks slightly, the stone shakes at its base. Agro comes over and together they put all their weight into- Wait, does the horse just like shoulder into this rock? Wait, what happens here? What is this stage direction? Help me, Agro. Agro comes over and together they put all their weight into it. The tomb topples, crashing sideways and splintering in two. Yeah, the horse just bodies into it. The farmer has returned to his daughter's grave with flowers. He's staring at Wander's shock, beholding the ancient sword around his waist. I can save her. And in the farmer's eyes, we see a vague glimpse for the first time of clarity. Farmer, go. Yeah, that is, King Jimmy, that is absolutely right. He is a drunk, foreign, person of color, savage, and whitey McOutsider has shown him the light and can save his daughter. That is exactly what has just happened. So, I am, go, I can't believe, the farmer's eyes we see a, see a vague glimpse for the first time of clarity. Go. Wander nods, throws her onto his horse, and rides off. Uh, also, the horse has a name. He gazes around. Vague outlines of cliffs border either side of the valley. No sense of where to go. Let's find some cover. Okay, so having somebody express their inner thoughts to their horse is is good and is effective, but just inane, constant banter is is bad. The wall bursts open, debris flying everywhere and barreling out from the darkness while emitting an ear-splitting shriek is Bassaran. Yep, they flip over Bassaran just like in the game, Dan. Uh, yeah, he kills Bassaran. Wander holds a writhing white-tailed lizard. Sorry, little guy, he pulls the tail off. Lizard blood oozes onto his hands. Nasty, the small creature squeaks. Wander releases it and lets it scamper off, liberated from its appendage. He stares at the unappetizing tail. Believe it or not, these things are supposed to be nutritional. He closes his eyes and takes a bite. Tastes goddamn awful. He forces himself to swallow, feeling the scales ooze down his gullet, then offers the rest to Agro. You should eat. You need it too. Now the tri oh. What the hell is this scene? Um, destruction of the hands of the demon. Uh, there we go. Hey, chop suey again. Go back. Jesus, this is just like... This is padding. This is padding. You want to know what script padding looks like? This is script padding. It's just three days of them, like, standing in a room. Suddenly a mechanized rumbling, lowering to the ground. Uh, Barba, human, all right. Yeah, this, again, more or less like the game, pretty much exactly 
sort of. Is this what you want? He raises the sword as we cut away to exterior temple exit twilight, a bellowing cry from the dark passage. Agro waiting outside backs off, a long deep resonating silence follows, and then timid footsteps. Agro steals himself ready for anything to emerge from the darkness. A dark emaciated form staggers closer. It's, yeah, it's Wander. We know it's Wander. There's this kind of a like, oh, what's coming out only works if it's like two people go in and only one comes out. It doesn't work when one person and one, you know, 40 foot rock monster go in. Lord Emon runs his hands along the course of the stone. He can't believe what the boy has done. Not possible. Then he suddenly kneels, pulls from a pouch several stone figurines, replicas of the idols. They're just idols. They're just tiny idols. But as soon as he touches them, three of them crumble in his hands. No! All right, now he's going to fight Avion and Leviathan immediately after. Oh, no, Hydrus. Hydrus immediately after. Swimming with everything he's got and finally emerging on top of a small grassy island gasping for breath. If only it were, it's not an island. This is Pelagia. So it's like back to back to back. Agra limps out of the cave, sound of hammering. He looks around at water, he's kneeling on a rock a little ways off, lifting a stone high in the air and banging it down repeatedly as Agra can see his horseshoe being bent back into shape one blow at a time. Wander picks up his mangled hoof and goes to work attaching the shoe. With what? Do you have nails? Statue of a bull fights Sonoba. All right. A somber march up the stairs towards the fortress, Wander is determined a warrior on the verge of fulfilling his destiny. This is what he was born to do. Dude, like, four days ago, you were a slave, an escaped slave eating pig slop, leading to a ravine dropping hundreds of feet into a river. A stone bridge stretches across it, their only way. Oh, here we go. Are they going to do it? Are they going to do it? They're about to make it until the very end when the last platform suddenly buckles backward. Agro flails back on his hind legs and knows what must be done. He bucks Wander over his head safely onto the opposite ledge. Wander lands forcefully on his back. He rolls over. No, wait. They only have time for one last look between each other before the last piece of the bridge snaps loose and the horse plummets into the ravine. Wander's face is pure horror. His hand is outstretched almost to the point of falling in himself. The horse fades to a small dot and vanishes. Agro is gone. I mean, that's that's straight from... Uh, that is... It's straight from the game. But more or less, I mean, it's been altered. But... In, in the context of an awful script, it's, it's just kind of funny. You are meddling with things you cannot begin to understand. Do you hear me, you cursed boy? You cannot save her. And off that line, Wander turns, all his hurt, a reaction against the cruel world finally funneling into rage. Watch me! He turns towards the cliff leading up to the dark fortress, the place where his journey will end. It's time to fulfill his destiny. He begins to scale the cliff. Across the ravine, the warriors unleash their arrows, their quarrels, it's a crossbow. Finally, he pulls himself over the ledge and beholds the towering fortress, a black winding spire, platforms, pediments, freezes, windows. Uh, freezes is spelt wrong. It's not, it's, it's F-R-I-E. In fact, that's exactly what it is. Joists and beams are trembling, stones sliding up on stones. Is it an earthquake or the fortress it's moving? Yeah, we know the fortress is, uh, uh, we know the fortress is malice. Here's actually, I'm really curious about this because in the game, you know, I did a whole episode talking more or less at length about this exact encounter. Wander dangles in the path of its gaze, just like he did with Barba, only this time he had anticipated this too. He writes himself on the palm of its hand and runs up its arm. While Malice tries to swat him with the other hand, Wander pulls himself on with the stone armor, armor onto a patch of fur on its shoulder. Sword glows. Stat. <laughs> Got you now, you bastard. On Wander's eyes, rage. The intensity of a young man who's lost everything he ever loved. Dude, dude. Dude, this is why the flashback is awful. He ha he's... Your, your, your sort of girlfriend who you've kissed once and you met, like, not even a week ago. You're... As we continue to pan down, we reach Wander, motionless amidst the rubble. His body is curled up. 
peaceful until it lifts up as if it's being carried by invisible tendrils rising heroically, majestically through the air, drifting towards the bright shining light as we cut to Shrine of Worship, Day, Wander opening his eyes. He's lying on the cold stone floor of the shrine. Is he in a dream? How did he get here? A ringing noise. The ancient sword is cartwheeling through the rotunda as if dropped from the sky, spinning blade over handle and lodging in the stone just a few feet away. Uh... You didn't know, you poor wretched thing. You didn't know this demon's true nature. All that you've done, all that you did was put our world in danger. Wanders look at him incredulous. Eamon kneels, anger turning to sorrow as he says, you were being used. He turns to the rest of his men. No joy in this decision. Put him out of his misery. There is no other choice. His cursed fate must end here. The chief warrior unsheaths his sword and steps forward. Wander stares up the blade as it raises over him. He's still trying to understand the mistake he's made when the chief warrior stabs him through the chest. Wander convulses his hand. Uh, then he was still dead, and this, so far, is more or less going as per the end of the game. <laughs> wait, what? Okay, wait, what? Another warrior raises a crossbow, but Dorman plucks him up and crushes him with his massive claws, savoring it. How I've missed this kind of joy. He bears down on Lord Emon, retreating against the pedestal. Your people will not stop us again. Now begins a new age, the age of the end of man. Flash to the glyph of the demon standing over the single warrior. We now see this warrior was Lord Emon. We're beginning to realize those glyphs were not a history, but a prophecy. Emon closes his eyes, preparing for death. Forgive us, our gods, the boy did not know. Dorman raises his fist, and just as he does, he sees Mono still lying dead on the pedestal just over Emon's shoulder. We suddenly zoom into Dorman's eyes. Oh, God. Flashback. You think it's... They find a tiny baby, they go to a secret garden, and the end. So... I, I couldn't tell you what the theme of that script was because it started out being about um, imprisonment and like, you know, yeah, it started out being about imprisonment and then all of a sudden in the last like 15 pages, 20 pages was about destiny. It's it's pretty bad. This is definitely a product of the guy who wrote The Legend of Chun-Li. Go. I was thinking about that the whole... The whole time I was getting a drink and uh, taking a quick bio break that... Go. I, I, don't, I don't know if I'm going to read anything ever again quite as asinine as that. I almost want this movie to exist just for how awful it would be. Like, this would give us... We would never... We would never stop talking... We should never stop talking about this screenplay. Like, really, this as it exists, this is this is amazing in, in how awful it is. Agro shouldering into the tomb. Again, I don't actually know what the... Because the way the tomb was described earlier... Uh, is that the tomb is, like, carved into the, like, the wall of the mountain. Um, but here it's able to topple. The warriors slide the top half of the stone shut. Oh, it's a sarcophagus. Yeah, it's, it's not... It's not a tomb, it's a sarcophagus. It's... (sighs) 
Okay. Yeah, it's... It's not a tomb, it's a sarcophagus. He doesn't know what words mean. So this line, the tomb topples crashing sideways and splintering in two, it didn't splinter in two. The lid came off. Cuz... I don't know why... This was the same kind of garbage I got hung up on in frickin' uh, Legend of Chun-Li. It's the same kinds of problems. It's just these tiny little, like, they just don't know. I, I, I want to meet Justin Marks at some point. I need to find out if Justin Marks, like, has ever left his house. He doesn't know what a turtle is. He doesn't know how cages work. He doesn't know what a horse is. You come around a corner. A strange man is pillaging the grave of your dead daughter. What do you say? In the farmer's eyes, we see a vague glimpse for the first time of clarity. Farmer, go. Wander nods, throws her onto his horse, and rides off. Yeah. Yeah.